interested in feeding a raw diet to your larger giant breed dog, well, you're in the right place because today I'm going to walk you through my top 10 tips, if I can do that, <laughs> top 10 tips for raw feeding larger giant breed dogs. And really what we're going to talk about is in addition to these 10 tips, I'm going to actually take you through from the beginning, you know, how do you put a meal together to putting the meals together, and then we will actually go outside and feed Junior and Sully. If you have followed my channel for any length of time, thank you for being here. I'm so happy to have you back. If you are new here, my name is Stephanie, AKA Big Dog Mom. And on this channel, I provide information and resources to help you and your big dog live your best life together. Okay. The first tip that I have for you, if you are a beginning raw feeder and looking to, to feed a raw diet to your large breed dog, is as it relates to balance. So, so balance is one of those things that you see everywhere when it comes to dog nutrition, feeding dogs, raw feeding, doesn't matter what aspect of dog nutrition you're talking about. Balance is a word that is used everywhere. So when we talk about raw feeding, what does balance mean? Generally speaking, when you feed a raw diet to a, a larger giant breed dog or any dog for that matter, we're talking about the balance of meat, bone, and organ. And in my previous video on raw feeding for beginners, where we kind of, we brought in all of the food in boxes and I kind of showed you what it looks like when you order through a raw food co-op. I shared with you in that video, the, this breakdown, and it's, eight, so it's 80% meat, 10% bone and 10% organ. The organ is then further broken down into liver and then other secreting organs. So when we think about balance, it starts with that, the 80-10-10. The From there, we need to think about it's balancing your calcium to phosphorus ratio. And we'll talk about that and I'm gonna make that more simple because it sounds really complex and scary. Um, the other thing that I think about when I think about balance for a raw diet for dogs is around supplementation and what sorts of things do I then add after I, after I put together a meal for my dogs, what do I add on top of it? One of the things that I love from Thomas Sandberg, who's from Long Living Pets Research Project and Foundation, is he, he put together what are called the eight laws of health for dogs. And I just love this concept because it really, it puts the health of our dogs and these, these kind of eight things, I'll, I'll list them off, but the, it really puts into perspective the holistic health of our dogs. He talks about feeding a nutrient dense diet uh, I'm looking at a, a note so I can make sure that I get them all. Ample exercise, which is hugely important, something that I think most of us don't do near enough of, most of us. Rest, water, which I think a lot of people don't really think about. Is your dog well hydrated? Sun and supplements, is your dog getting outside? Are you supplementing? So probiotics and some other things. And again, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Temperance and trust. And I, and I think those last two are really, uh, something that again is not, it's overlooked. I think oftentimes people think about dog ownership and it's, oh, we have this pet dog. But there's so much that goes into living with a dog and understanding having that mutual trust with your dog. And I talk a lot about this as it relates to nail trimming. So if you've been following Big Dog Mom for any length of time, then you know this, that I am obsessed with dog nails and it trust is, is the most critical part of being able to trim your dog's nails without force, fear, or frustration. So I just love those, those eight things that he kind of helps us put into perspective. And, and when we think about a raw, raw diet, raw feeding for our dogs, a holistic look at your dog's health. And this is just one piece of that. So I, I hope that helps. Okay, let's move on to number two. The second tip that I have for you is as it relates to the calcium and phosphorus ratio, especially for large and giant breed dogs. So the ideal ratio of calcium to phosphorus, well, the amount, I should say, the amount of calcium that you want is around 1%. The amount of phosphorus that you want is around 0.8% on a dry matter basis. So that's the amount that you want in the diet. Well, most people will hear that and be, you know, will think, there is no way that I would have the first clue if I'm just putting all, all of these ingredients together. How do I figure that out? So let me tell you, if you're feeding a raw diet that's all meat and doesn't include any bone, well then your phosphorus ratio is gonna be too high and you're not gonna have enough calcium. Uh, on the other side, if you're feeding all bone 
um, and not enough meat, well then your calcium is going to be too high and your phosphorus would be too low. The importance of keeping those two things in balance, the kind of the 1% of calcium, 0.8% phosphorus, and really what that amounts to when it comes to the ratio is a 1.2% to one ratio of calcium to phosphorus. And when those things, when it's out of balance, if you have too much of one, not enough of the other, it leads to skeletal problems. So with that in mind, okay, so that's the basics of the calcium phosphorus ratio, but how do you calculate it? So let's walk through a quick example that I hope will help you visually see what that looks like in terms of balancing the calcium phosphorus ratio uh, for a large breed dog. Any bone content over about 10% is pretty much it is pretty much perfect. You don't want to go more than 25%. But here's how you calculate your calcium phosphorus ratio on a dry matter basis. So here's a quick calculation. It's pretty simple. So if I use a chicken back, which is 45% bone, and I have a chicken back that's 5.5 ounces, and the beef that I'm using is 10.6 ounces, and then I add five ounces of turkey, I've got 15.6 ounces of, tur of beef and turkey, so the meat portion, plus a raw meaty bone, 5.5 ounces for the chicken back. So what we want to do is add our beef and our turkey. So remember I said it was 10.6 ounces plus five ounces of turkey, and that is 15.6 ounces. So what I want to do is figure out the ratio of the chicken back to the rest of what I've added, okay? So again, going back to what I said before, the chicken back is the, the piece that I picked out was 5.5 ounces. And that is what we are going to then divide by 15.6. So what that gives you is your percentage of the but the raw meaty bone to the the meat that you have in there. So it's going to be about 35%, but 0.35. You just have to remember the 0.35. So now let's go back, and now we're going to say the percentage of bone in that chicken back was 45%, and we are going to multiply that times the 0.35 that we just calculated. And that gives us 15.75. So what that tells you is that the meal that I have put together is 15.75% bone. Now, when you add organ to that, then that's going to further reduce your actual percentage of bone. But what we are trying to focus on is that calcium phosphorus ratio, which is primarily going to be impacted by the meat and the bone portion of the meal, not so much the organ. Often when I tell people I feed the dogs, Junior and Sully, a raw diet, they, that is one of their first questions. So you just feed them bones? They just eat the bones? <laughs> but yes, they do. They can only eat raw bones though. So let me explain. What you never ever want to do and think that you're somehow cleaning their teeth or it's somehow, they even sell them in stores and I can't believe that people buy them and feed them to their dogs, but that's smoked bones or cooked bones. You never wanna feed anything that's been processed, any type of bone that's been processed in any way. But the second thing is, and this is particularly important for large and giant breed dogs because especially as your dog or, or puppy grows, their mouths are much bigger. My general rule is that I don't feed anything that would be so small that the dogs wouldn't need to chew it to swallow it. So I hope that makes sense. Like chicken necks, um, are usually, you know, they're like, I don't know, it's hard to do this on camera, but they're like this big around and they're like that big. They're really tiny. Um, and so like a chicken neck, I would be less comfortable with than a turkey neck, which is more like a foot long, 13 inches long. Um, and so the 13 inch bone allows the dog to be chewing on it and slowly getting pieces off and consuming it piecemeal um, from a larger from a larger piece. Again, I've never had any trouble. One of the things that I would suggest you do if you're transitioning your dog to a raw diet is go slow when it comes to introducing new types of bones. The key is just to observe your dog and see how well they're managing the bone. If you have a dog, like I will tell you between Junior and Sully, Sully is a boss when it comes to bone. He can eat anything. He is efficient and he is like a wolf out there. <laughs> but Junior takes twice as long to chew the same type of bone that Sully does. So you'll see differences even between your dogs. But 
but that's a thing to think about. So you don't you want to make sure that you choose bones that are appropriate for the size of your dog, keeping in mind those choking hazards. Okay, tip number four is observe your dog's stools. So when you're starting to feed a raw diet for your dog, observing your dog's stools is going to be one of the most important ways that you observe how well your dog is tolerating the raw diet, how well you've got everything balanced, and it really is just. Uh, an indicator of your dog's overall health. When you're feeding a raw diet, remember it's 80% meat, 10% bone, 10% uh, organ. Now the bone content, I say fluctuates between 10 and 25% because some days I'll feed more bone than other days. Generally speaking, I try to stay around the 15%. As I showed you in the previous step where we were talking about the calcium phosphorus ratio and with that percentage of bone and the higher you go, you'll notice the stools get white and chalky. And the more white and chalky they are can tell you how much bone your dog has been eating. Conversely, if you're feeding too much organ, it'll go the other direction. You'll see more soft, you know, black, sort of tarry, maybe even looser stools. So you just balance that with bones. So if your dog has looser stools one day, then I would say the next couple of days feed just a tiny bit more bone. And it usually will just regulate right back, nice firm stools. The fifth tip that I have for you has to do with variety. So one of the things that I mentioned in that prior raw feeding video for beginners is the idea that really you want to make sure that you're providing a variety of different protein sources. So think about, you know, your own diet. It's, it's always better to have whole foods versus processed and more different types of whole foods than it is to stay with just a single raw, a single whole food, for example. So if the only vegetable you ever ate was cucumber, well then you're probably missing out on some of the added benefits of kale or tomato or carrots, for example. So when I think about my dog's diet, it's really with that same thought process in mind. So protein sources, you can get protein sources from a number of different places. When you order in bulk, it's pretty easy to do. I always just kind of say at least three protein sources, if not four, not counting my fish. So, you know, that's beef, chicken, turkey, duck, pork, um, and then the fish, as I mentioned, I have smelt and sardines in our freezer, but you can feed salmon, you can feed other stuff as well. So you will just wanna make sure that you feed, you know, a variety of different protein sources, a variety of different, you know, kind of the prebiotics, the vegetables and the fruits, and, you know, just, throwing other things in as well. So, you know, I give raw eggs pretty frequently. I would say probably three days a week or four days a week, they'll get a raw egg in their meal. They love raw egg. Um, what else do I put in there? I mean, sometimes I'll put like, um, like kefir or like an organic yogurt. If I have some um, pumpkin, they love pumpkin and that just kind of keeps their stools really nice. You know, or something like chia seeds. I have fed those too. It's a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. So, you know, just keep that idea in mind, you know, the idea of variety and balance over time, and you will be just fine. Okay, let's move on to tip number six. Tip number six is supplementation. So I mentioned before that when I think about balance, balance is not just the 80-10-10 meat, bone, and organ. It really is also, in my mind, includes supplementation. So there are a few things that I consider staples for me as it relates to supplementation. So sometimes people will say like the eggs would be sort of a supplement, right? I don't calculate the weight of an egg in the dog's food. I don't calculate the egg in any way for my dog's diet. There are people that will create a menu for you actually, and I'm sure they factor in the egg, but I just don't. I try not to overthink, otherwise I won't, I can't begin if it's overwhelming. So I try to keep things very simple, but Nonetheless, sometimes people will say like an egg would be a supplement. When I say supplements though, I'm actually more referring to something that I've talked about on Big Dog Mom pretty extensively and I do have a video about it and that's um, organic sea kelp uh, from Raw Paws Pet Food. I feed that uh, on a daily basis and then a new uh, supplement that I started is their um, organic pumpkin powder. So we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then I always feed a probiotic. So one probiotic that I was recently introduced to is called uh, Daily Dog by Full Bucket Health. And this particular probiotic I found really fascinating because if you are familiar with Big Dog Mom and the blog, you know that I have written many posts on probiotics and my 
firm belief that every dog on the planet needs to be on a probiotic. And I have lots of reasons for that, which I'm not going to go into here. But suffice it to say, I believe in probiotics. 70% of your dog's immune system is, is basically regulated and starts in your dog's gut. So when that is out of balance, then everything can be out of whack. This probiotic is actually a yeast-based probiotic. It contains 5 billion colony forming units of Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a very well studied, well known yeast. There's two main benefits to feeding a, a yeast based probiotic, and that is number one, you don't have to worry about over colonization in the gut. So, a lot of times when people will feed a bacterial based probiotic, you can get out of balance with that too. It's like too much of a good thing. And so some of the bacteria, they can, they can sort of colonize in the gut and cause issues. So that would be the downside of a bacterial probiotic. The other benefit is, especially for dogs who are on an antibiotic, feeding a yeast-based probiotic has no conflicts. You're giving yeast, which doesn't compete with the bacteria where if you're feeding a bacterial base, the good bacteria with a probiotic, and you're also using an antibiotic, which is killing the bacteria, well, you're sort of doing nothing then, right? That one negates the other, especially if they're fed uh, at the same time. So you definitely don't want to do that. Um, my recommendation is always to separate those by about two hours and feed your probiotic on an empty stomach. And then the other couple of supplements that I've been giving, so again, I mentioned the sea kelp. I have written a, a blog post and a review on the organic mineral rich sea kelp from Raw Paws Pet Food. So I won't go to a ton of detail, but this is really where I feel like my dogs get their micronutrients, trace elements, things that I can't possibly capture in just the few ingredients that I'm feeding my dogs on a daily basis. So while I try to keep that diet varied, it's just impossible to capture everything. Okay, and then the last one, and this is more of a newer one that I've started to feed. Let's see if we can... There we go, that looks good. But this is their new pumpkin powder, and this is really a source of fiber. And so this is, like I said, I do sometimes feed like canned pumpkin, but this I thought was a really good supplement to add for, again, just maintaining that gut health. As you know, in that previous video, I talked about the fact that I had just recently transitioned the dogs back to a raw diet. So this was one of those things that I used to kind of help. So if you're new to raw feeding, this may be something that you want to keep on hand and just start as you're starting your diet, feed this too. It can help firm up stools if you have a problem with some loose stools in the beginning, which most dogs do. And it's, it's going to be a great source of vitamin C, as I said, fiber, vitamin A, magnesium, and potassium. So definitely check, check that out, especially if you're a new raw feeder. I would really say all three of those are, I feel like, would be a great foundational sort of supplement mix to add to a new raw diet for your large breed dog. Okay, let's move on to number seven. So my seventh tip has to do with your phone. So what I'm gonna do right now is just walk you through the app that I use, it's called Raw Pet. You can download it from the App Store. I believe you can get it for Android and iPhone, but don't quote me on that, I use an iPhone. So I'll show you how that app can really help you as you start to kind of put your dog's diet together. Okay, I wanted to show you a quick, uh, simple app that you can use if you're considering a raw diet for your dogs, and that is called Raw Pet. And this is an app that I've been using for many years. I'm sure there are others in the app store that are equally as fantastic, but this is one that uh, I wanted to quick just walk you through how it, this functions. So at the bottom of my screen, you can see where it says settings. So that is the screen that we are on. Okay, so you can see that I have two Mastiffs, Junior and Sully. You can see their names at the top. You set that up when you first download the app. It'll walk you through. It takes all of, you know, a minute to set up your dog in, in the app. And basically, you just put in your dog's weight. If you have a puppy, you could toggle this button on and then include how the age of your puppy. But since I don't, Junior is an adult Mastiff, I leave that toggled off. You can see the daily recommended percentage is a default at 2.5%. And that is a pretty uh, common percentage that people use. You can see that I have Junior set at 2% of his body weight. 
use daily recommended percentage, that's going to put, you can see at the bottom, that 2.5% when I toggle that on. If I toggle it off, it's set to whatever you want to set it to. I have mine set for two meals per day. The other thing you will, you'll notice on the lower right-hand side, it says metric and imperial. If you change that to metric, you'll see at the top where it changes the weight to kilograms. Here in the United States, we normally will use the imperial unit, which would be pounds. If I just click on Sully's name, it takes you to about what he weighs. He's about 195 pounds and could stand to lose a little bit of weight. And he's getting older, so he's a little more sedentary. He's not a highly active dog. So I have his percent of his body weight to feed per day is 1.7%, again, broken down to two meals per day. Okay, so let's take you to the next tab at the very bottom. You'll see where it says settings and then feeding. And feeding is really the most useful part of this app when we talk about you know balancing a raw diet one of the kind of foundational components to that is the percentage of meat bone and organ that you're going to feed and then you'll see where it also says total so when you're weighing out your food you just are gonna you're gonna break this down i typically will start with the organ and you break that down into five percent of you know other secreting organs 5% liver so the total of organ is going to be about 10% about 10% maybe a little more of bone and then the rest in meat and then the other and last thing that I wanted to show you on this app that I thought was really helpful and I've and I've actually used this resource a few times in the past and that is at the very bottom you'll see where it says reading and these are just a number of different documents that are, are really helpful, especially if you're a beginner. Reading through them can bring a wealth of information for you. There's some frequently asked questions, and this is a raw feeding guide poster that I'm sure most of us have seen before, but I think at a click of a button, it's kind of nice to see, you know, what, what are some of the other excreting organs that you can feed? And then, you know, what, what types of bone, some key aspects to raw feeding in terms of, you know, you never would feed cooked bone or smoked bone or anything like that. Raw bone is the only bone you should be feeding. And then some of the tips on, you know, what what fruits and vegetables and those sorts of things shouldn't be fed to a dog, among other things, xylitol, caffeine, etc. Let's move on to tip number eight. Tip number eight is get a good scale. So this is the one I bought. There's nothing particularly fancy about it. It's pretty basic. The biggest thing I would tell you is that, you know, I wouldn't spend a ton of money, but, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't buy the cheapest one, but I also probably wouldn't buy the most expensive one. I think this one cost me maybe $30 on... I, I can't even remember. I bought it so long ago. Quite honestly, I can't remember how much it cost. I will put a link uh, to the same one uh, on Amazon down in the description below, so you can so you can check it out. But basically, my biggest tip was just to make sure that you can get multiple different uh, units on here. So I most of the time just use ounces, but it is nice sometimes to be able to go from ounces and pounds. It also has grams and kilograms on this one as well. So that is, that is tip number eight, pretty short, quick and simple, is just get a good scale. The other thing I will mention as it, as it relates to appliances, I talked about before the use of a grinder. I will tell you I have one experience with a grinder and it did not go well. It actually did not even give me enough food for one meal. It was so bad. And I don't know if it was just the grinder that I used or that I didn't do it right. I have no idea. But when I first started raw feeding Junior when he was a puppy, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll just try it. Maybe, you know, as he's starting to learn how to chew bones, maybe that would be a good thing. I don't know. I got it in my head that I needed one. So I bought a grinder and I literally couldn't even hardly grind chicken in it. So it was just a total waste. It was so much work to clean it. I just thought this is not anything that I need to use. And from then on, I actually sold it after that first use. I got it all cleaned up and, and actually I think I donated it now that I think about it. But nonetheless, I don't think you need a grinder. You know, if you're thinking you need a grinder, I would maybe, pref I would probably recommend to just start with softer bones first before you invest in a grinder. Now, that said, I know many raw feeders love them, use them all the time. And my only conclusion is that it probably is the one that I bought that was so bad. 
but it wasn't cheap, so I have no idea. But nonetheless, I probably would not get a grinder unless you really feel strongly that you just do not want to mess with the bones and you would, you would feel more comfortable grinding that up. You can also purchase pre-ground. So from most uh, co-ops, you can actually order your meat already ground up. So it'll say on the label or you can ask your co-op uh, person, you know, get me something that's already pre-ground. And sometimes they'll even have it all weighed and balanced for you. So that would be something to consider as well. If you're starting out and you just want to keep it super simple and you're kind of afraid of the whole bone thing, I totally understand that. So maybe seek out, you know, a raw food co-op to ask some of those questions as well. Okay, let's move on. Tip number nine, just two more. So as you can see in this video, uh, my tip number nine has to do with feeding. If you have multiple dogs, my recommendation would be to feed them separately for a number of different reasons. So the first reason is to avoid any potential conflicts. Junior is the most mild-mannered, sweet dog on the face of the planet unless he's chewing a bone. And when he's chewing a bone, it's not like he's mean. He doesn't go after Sully. But if Sully hovers a little too close to him, he does growl. And it's the only time I've ever heard Junior growl ever. <laughs> so that's that, that would be my first tip. Make sure you kind of keep your dogs, and you know your dog best. If you have any sort of resource guarding, feeding a raw diet can potentially bring that out in a dog where it is prized food and you can see sort of that inner wolf come out in, in many dogs. If you're able to, when we lived in Arizona, I had a gate that I could feed Sully in by the pool and I could feed Junior on the patio. And that helped not only the, you know, the potential eliminating any potential conflicts, which never happened, but just the potential that it was there if I were to walk away it only takes a split second. So I wanted to avoid that. But then the second thing is, you know, Sully is kind of a fatty. He just, he loves food. And so if Junior, what happened a few times before I, you know, put the gate in between them was that Junior would pull a piece, you know, say a raw meaty bone or a sardine or something out of his food and he would go chew it. As you can see in this video, uh, he does the same thing now. He basically will pull something out of his bowl and go lay down and chew it. Sully does the same thing, but Junior takes so long to eat that what I was finding would happen is that he's still chewing, Sully's completely finished, and then he goes and cleans out Junior's bowl. You know, like I said, Sully has a little bit of a weight issue anyway because he's neutered and older and a little more sedentary. Uh, so we want to make sure that we avoid, you know, excess caloric intake by the dog eating too much. And so, you know, you've spent the time to weigh out the food and get it all balanced and get it all perfect. The last thing you want to do is have one dog eat the meal, uh, eat uh, the amount of food for two dogs. So tip number 10 is rest easy with balance over time. And that really is the crux of feeding raw, in my opinion. It really is don't ever stress out about a single meal or a single day's meal or even a week of meals. I really think about my dog's diet from a monthly perspective. Like over the course of the month, how did their stools look? How many protein sources did they get fairly regularly? You know, were they getting supplementation? How did they feel? Were there any odd, you know, medical things that popped up? Maybe trying to, you know, figure out why that might be. Um, skin issues with Junior are a thing. And so as we've started to transition to a raw diet, his skin looks a lot better. But I constantly monitor that as well, trying to find, you know, supplements and other things that can help improve his skin. It is just... Keep in mind balance over time. And I hope that that is a message that will resonate with you if you are at all on the fence about feeding a raw diet to your large breed dog, as long as you kind of keep in mind your dog's holistic health. Are they getting exercise? Are they getting water regularly? You know, they're well hydrated. They're getting a probiotic every day and, and uh, optimal supplements to help with the micronutrients and all of that stuff. All right, I'm gonna give you one last bonus tip and it is primarily because I completely space yesterday as I was filming this video and forgot one of the most important things that I do when I'm feeding my dogs. I do 
I do show it in this video, so you'll see what I'm doing, but I wanted to just address really quick the issue of, you know, keeping things clean. It is one of the most common questions I get, and that is, you know, how do you how do you prevent bacterial infections? So either myself getting sick from preparing raw food for the dogs or the dogs themselves getting sick. Now, I can only speak from my own experience. I've never had an issue. I actually have a degree in microbiology and so have always been somebody that keeps things pretty clean, not overly clean, and I understand the benefits of our systems being challenged by things in our environment. There's bacteria and viruses everywhere and all over you all the time. So that is something that I, I have a basic understanding of. But the thing that I wanted to share with you as it relates to keeping things clean is just how I, how I do that as I'm preparing their food as well as how I clean up after. So the two components of this is really so when I'm preparing the food for the dogs, I just wash my hands pretty frequently. I do always have kind of a wipe or something if it, if it gets, if I drib dribble, you know, food or juices, I sometimes will wipe that up as I'm preparing. Not usually, I'll usually do everything first and then clean up after, that's kind of my, my tactic. But you can get like Clorox wipes or anything else. You could even use like just vinegar and water if you, prepare to, if you prefer to do that. You could spray down with that as well. So the second component to this is really how do I get the dogs clean after they're done eating. Generally speaking, what I do, the dogs always eat outside where we live, it's not a problem. And even in the winter in Michigan, we didn't have any problems with the dogs eating outside. So that said, the dogs eat outside. I usually just spray the concrete after they're done eating and just kind of make sure that that's, that's really pretty clean. And then, um, but I don't sanitize out there. The UV rays is going to kill anything that's out there. So I just spray to get it all clean. And then on the dogs, as you'll see in this video, I basically just use like something like apple cider vinegar, like a diluted apple cider vinegar. And then I just kind of wipe their faces really well and then their paws. I make sure to get inside the um, pads of their paws in between their toes, that sort of thing, because that would be a really common area for bacterial or yeast growth. So I just, I just do that. And again, I've been raw feeding for a very long time, never had an issue. So if you have any questions about uh, this concept of you know keeping things sanitized and clean when you're raw feeding your dog um, let me know in the comments below but the one thing I'll leave you with is just this thought you know if preparing raw meat for your dog is no different than you preparing raw meat for your family and and that is you know when I'm preparing raw meat for my family I wipe down all surfaces I make sure to prevent any kind of cross-contamination if I've touched raw meat with something or a juice with something I wash it, I, you know, clean it, keep things separated, that sort of thing. So, you know, again, it's no different for human raw meat as it is for the meat that you're feeding your dogs. It's, this, it's the same concept. I hope this last little bonus tip, tip number 11, helps you out. If you, again, have any questions, leave them in the comments below. This is the question for the day. What additional questions do you have about raw feeding your larger giant breed dog? My hunch is that between the two videos so far in this series, I probably have not addressed every question that's out there from beginning raw feeders. So whatever questions you have, definitely put those in the comments below. And that's what I'll focus on for our next video in this series. What I'd like this to be is just really a one-stop shop for large and giant breed dog owners who are interested in transitioning their dog to a raw diet. And if you are a raw feeder and you have large and giant breed dogs, I would absolutely love it if you would just add your insight to the comments as well. I think the comment section can definitely be a source of tremendous tremendous expertise and information for uh, beginners. And so definitely, you know, add to this video as much as you see fit. Did I miss anything? And what would you add to it? What other tips might you have for a beginning raw feeder? Put those in the comments below. And if you haven't done so already, hit that like button if you like this video and consider subscribing to this channel if you enjoy big dog related content. Thanks so much for watching and we will see you in our next video. Bye for now.